All right. Well, let's define a few positions. I believe very strongly that the Earth is about 6,000 years old. It was created in six literal 24-hour days. This position would make a few predictions. The Bible says clearly, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and all that in them is. Everything created in six days. Now, based on that prediction, based on that uh, pre pre premise, we can make a few predictions, which is what science is supposed to do. A scientific theory is supposed to allow you to make predictions. I predict, based on the Bible teaching, that uh, the universe will show evidence of order and design all over the place, okay? I predict that we'll find thousands of symbiotic relationships in nature, animals that require certain plants and plants that require certain animals, and it works just fine because they were all created within a few days of each other. Not a problem at all for the creationist viewpoint. I predict that there will be limits to the variations that life forms are able to produce. The Bible says they will bring forth after their kind, and that's what we've observed. Our 6,000 years of human history shows us dogs produce dogs every time. It might be a big dog or a little dog, it might have curly hair or straight hair, but it's going to be a dog, guaranteed, okay? Farmers actually count on that. I mean, when they plant corn, they expect to get corn. And so far, it has happened. So certainly there are variations, but there are definite limits to the variations, and this is where the major difference comes between the creationist and the evolutionist. I predict that there are not only limits to the variation, I predict that there will be actually a purpose to life because we were designed by a creator for a purpose. That's a prediction based on the Bible view. I predict there will be non-material things like love, sense of justice, mercy, innate knowledge of right and wrong, a conscience, and absolute truth. Those things are not possible with the evolution theory. They are predicted based on the creation theory. Somebody designed this for a reason. I predict that there will be a way to find the will of the creator, such as messengers speaking for him, or may maybe even a book telling us why he did it and how he did it. Mm -hmm. I predict there will be an afterlife where we will face the creator to give an accounting. Okay? The Bible dates, if you add them up in Scripture, comes to about 6,000 years ago for the creation, not millions. There's a large difference between 6,000 and 20 billion. Congress doesn't seem to understand that, but there is a big difference, okay? Now, based on the Bible teaching that uh, the earth was originally created where people lived to be 900 years old, I predict we will find lots of uh, legends about a golden age and a creation event. This seems to be kind of universal throughout history. Most people believe there was a creation, and most people believe there was a time when man used to live to, near, to be nearly a thousand. The Greeks talked about it, the Babylonians talked about it, the Sumerians, everybody talked about this golden age. Why? Well, that's predicted based on the creation viewpoint, okay? I predict there will be skeletons found of people showing signs of great age because they were living to be much older, you know, before uh, things happen. And as you grow, especially the brow ridge of your head never stops growing. The constant pull on the back of your head, the occipital bun, based on just the muscles from holding your head forward, is going to elongate the head over two or three or four hundred years. People would look exactly like the Neanderthals look. Brain 13% bigger than ours, few strange things about their head, but 100% human in every respect. I predict that there will be biological problems with modern man, such as wisdom teeth, because we're not as big as we used to be. And we're developing probably faster. People are maturing faster. They're only living to be in 80 or 90 instead of living to be 900. And wisdom teeth are a problem today, not because of evolution, but because we're actually genetically inferior to the original model, Adam and Eve, okay? I predict that there'll be a universal longing for things to be restored to the Garden of Eden conditions. That's what everybody seems to want, okay? Now, what difference does it make if you believe in evolution or creation? Well, if evolution is true, how do we tell right from wrong? Any time tonight, I would like any one of these gentlemen to answer the simple question, if evolution is true, how does anybody tell right from wrong? If I wanted you to make a list of ten things that are wrong, before you put anything on the list, I want to know how are you deciding? Are you deciding right from wrong based on what Osama bin Laden thinks? Do we decide right from wrong based on what Congress thinks? Do we decide right from wrong based on the majority? How do we decide right from wrong? Simple question I've never had it answered. If evolution is true, death brought man into the world, and death is actually the hero of the plot. Because if evolution is true, one animal evolves a little better than the rest, for some reason, maybe a mutation or something. What, ha what must happen to the rest of them? They have to die. Otherwise, the good genes are diluted back into the population and lost. Evolution is a religion of death. Death is actually the hero of the plot. If the Bible is true, then man brought death into the world. If evolution is true, death brought man into the world. These two views cannot possibly be more opposite. Somebody is wrong. And I enjoy showing them who they are, and that's why I'm here. Okay, now, 
The Bible says clearly that by one man sin came into the world and death by sin. The reason we have death and suffering today is because of man's disobedience to the Creator. The Bible says by man came death, in Adam all die. We have suffering and death because of man's disobedience. If evolution is true, you could read Charles Darwin's book, page 170, or page 217. He said, hey, we, we, the death and struggle for life is, the, is a wonderful thing. That's how we get ahead. Okay? Now, the creation view says there was a flood about 4,400 years ago. Now, this would make a few predictions. Based on the idea that there was a universal flood, I think I could predict that the earth will have hundreds of layers of strata. Floods automatically do that. Moving water sorts particles in all sorts of layers. You can get a jar of dirt, add some water to it, and shake it up and set it down, and in 20 seconds you'll have layers forming in your jar. Moving water automatically sorts particles. It's called hydrologic sorting. You engineers ought to know about that. I predict, based on the Bible teaching of the flood, that there will be billions of fossils, including coal and oil, found in the those layers of sedimentary rock that we find all over the earth. I predict there will be huge canyons and deltas showing evidence of rapid, massive erosion. I predict there will be legends of this worldwide flood found in cultures all over the world. That's a prediction based on the biblical view. Bible, biblical view of creation is certainly scientific. It makes predictions. Okay. I predict there will be petrified trees in the vertical position extending through all of these layers. Thousands and thousands of these trees have been found around the world, petrified, standing up, connecting layers that some people want you to believe are different ages. Now, I don't know how long a dead tree stands up around here before it falls down, but up in Pensacola you get maybe five or ten years maximum before the tree falls over. And yet they're telling us these layers are different ages. We have dozens of pictures of these polystrate fossils on our website, drdino.com. Now, if somebody wants you to believe the layers are different ages by millions of years, well, they're welcome to teach you whatever they want, but this is simply not in, in accordance with the evidence. I believe the Bible would predict we would find things like this, polystrate fossils. A worldwide flood would do that. Now, science means knowledge, okay? A more expanded definition of science means knowledge gained by observation and study and testing. My contention is there is absolutely nothing scientific about the evolution theory if we define what we mean by evolution carefully, which I want to do in my last few minutes here. I like science. I taught high school science for 15 years. I love the study of science. I am not against science, but I'm against using lies to support a theory. And I'm certainly against telling people that it, science can go farther than it really can. Okay, now, Texas has a law that requires textbooks to be accurate. So does Florida. Florida Statute 1006 says there must be accuracy of instructional materials. Textbooks ought to be accurate. Wisconsin says textbooks ought to be accurate. Alabama says textbooks shall be adequate and current. California says textbooks shall be factually accurate. Minnesota says a teacher shall not deliberately suppress or distort subject matter. These are all wonderful laws, but not one of those states enforces them. The textbook says we have evidence of evolution. Okay, what kind of evidence do they give? This guy says evolution is fact, not theory. Birds arose from non-birds and humans from non-humans. No person who pretends to any understanding of the natural world can deny these facts. Well, it's okay to make a statement like that, but that's just a mantra. That doesn't make it true because he states it. Even if he states it loudly and forcefully, it doesn't make it true, okay? The word evolution has six different meanings. First of all, there would have to be cosmic evolution. That would be the origin of time, space, matter. They try to answer that with the Big Bang Theory, with which there are numerous problems. We cover that on our videotape number one. The second meaning or level or stage of the evolution theory would have to be chemical evolution. If the Big Bang produced hydrogen, well then how did we get all these other elements? They want me to believe that uranium evolved from hydrogen? That's, oh yeah, you get fusion in stars. Well, first place, you can't fuse past iron, number one. And secondly, if you want the stars to produce the elements, you have a chicken and an egg problem here. Which came first, the elements to make the stars or the stars to make the elements? You have a real problem here, but they never talk about chemical evolution. I'd like to hear that answer tonight. Thirdly, we'd have to have stellar evolution. The stars would have to evolve. Nobody's ever proven the formation of any one star. We see a few, st few spots getting brighter and they're assuming a star is forming. No, it could be the dust is clearing. It could be a supernova taking place. There's, there's all kinds of explanations. Nobody's ever proven a star can form. And yet it's known now that there are about 11 trillion stars per person f f on this planet. Each of you can own 11 trillion of them. How do the stars evolve? Fourthly, we have to have organic evolution, the origin of life. How did life get started? Fifthly is macroevolution, where an animal changes to a different kind of animal. Nobody's ever seen any of these first five. Lastly is what's called microevolution. I object to the term, but they use it, so I'll use it. Microevolution tells us there are varieties within the same kind. Big dogs, little dogs, okay. 
This one happens. The first five are purely religious. And if you want to believe in those first five, you enjoy yourself, but don't call it science. And don't make me pay to teach that to the next generation of kids as part of science, because it's not. It's nothing but a religion. They teach 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, and you know, that's what, that's what the evolution theory is based on. You have to have an origin point. 18 or 20 billion years ago, there was a Big Bang. I think the evolution theory, as is currently taught in our textbooks, is totally unscientific. There's no, not a shred of evidence to back it up, and I simply resent paying for it. So my position is that the evolution theory, which teaches clearly 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, then it says millions of years of torrential rains created the oceans as the earth cooled down, you know, cooled down into a rocky crust, and then oceans formed over millions of years. This textbook says, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Sure is. It don't even happen. That's how slow it is. This guy said the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So according to the evolution theory, 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down. It rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. So great, 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 great grandpa was soup. Okay? Now, it's true there's a lot of dogs in the world, but they didn't come from a rock 3.4 billion years ago, whatever you want to say. So. The evolution is a dying religion surviving only on tax dollars. Evolution theory is positively anti-science. There's not a shred of real evidence to support any of the theories except oft-repeating lies. Let's define one more term in my last 30 seconds. Stupid. Lacking normal intelligence. Foolish. Silly. A stupid idea. Dull and boring. Evolution is not even a good theory. I think it is stupid. Thank you. <laughs> Professors, you now have 12 minutes to present your opening arguments and additional five minutes to rebuttal Dr. Hoven's position and state a question back to him. Thank you. Well, I suppose you'd like to know what I teach when I teach evolution. Um, I think you should take a look at the black sheet up here to see what the definition of evolution is. Biological evolution is the change in the gene pool of population over time. It's really very simple. Do we have a gene pool? Do we have DNA? Well, of course we do. Every living thing has DNA. Does it change? Well, of course it does. We can see it change. We know what, what DNA sequencing is. We do it all the time. We can check the genes in any plant or animal now that we want to. Um, has there been a, a time enough, enough time for that to happen? Well, of course there has. Uh, if you'll take a, a look at the the, the, the green sheet over here, you'll see that the age of the Earth has been found out by astronomers studying the age of the Earth, the geologists of the age of the Earth. Uh, uh, we use the radioactivity to find out the age. We've used plate tectonics and the movement of planets. We use biology. And what's interesting about these things is that they've all arrived at the same answer using different science. If one of them had found a different answer, there would have been something wrong. But they didn't. The astronomers agreed with the geologists, and the geologists agreed with radioactivity, and the radioactivity agreed with plate tectonics. They all agreed on a basic time that we've just heard, four and a half billion uh, years old. Now, how do, I, how do I try to get this across to my students? Well, uh, I talk to them about natural selection. See, what natural selection really means, if you look at the red card down here, uh, is that Everything that has genes overproduces. Everything that has DNA overproduces. So there's always more population than can, can be there. Now, let me give you an example. If you started out with two cockroaches, and cockroaches lived in a perfect place, a cockroach per perfect place, at the end of seven months, there would be 164 billion of them. Well, there's not 164 billion of them because there's no perfect place for them. Instead, they're in competition with each other. They're in competition for food, they're in competition for space, and they're in competition for mating. So what happens is that there has to be a survival. Well, who survives? Some people say the survival of the fittest. Well, that means you don't understand evolution. It's not survival of the fittest. It's survival of the one that can live long enough to find a mate and reproduce. Ants work together. Only one of them is going to reproduce. The rest of them are going to try to help somebody reproduce. So it's survival of the fit, not survival of the fittest. 
And then, of course, what happens is those individuals get to reproduce and that species survives. But look, we talked about billions and billions of cockroaches not surviving. Why is that? And the answer is they had some genetic changes that weren't good. Uh, the idea is to have some tiny little ch changes in your DNA. Maybe it takes five or six, seven, 20 generations for it to show up even. But when it does show up, it's good. Evolution is extremely inefficient. So is photosynthesis inefficient. Biological processes are inefficient. It's just a bad design. But what happens is some of them make it and you know, some of them don't. Um, so when I'm doing this, I, I, I have to use some kind of a science. So if you look at the black sheet down here with the blue markings around it, uh, I talk about fossils and I talk about genetics and I talk about homology or the structures of plants and animals. And I talk about distribution in the planet and I talk about embryology. But what's interesting about these things is they all agree. They all approach evolution from a different point of view and yet they agree. If we didn't have any fossils at all, none, it wouldn't matter. We still have enough information to prove that evolution took place. If we didn't have any homologic structures to look at, it doesn't matter. We still have enough evolution uh, facts to show that it took place. Now, I, have a, I had a, a problem solved for me by the Supreme Court. It happens that, that there have been nine cases brought by creationists to the federal courts uh, against uh, uh, evolution. They were competing against each other in the Supreme Court. Um, the first one of those cases that really was important uh, took place in, in 1968. But in 1982, the Supreme Court case of McClellan versus the Kansas Board of Education ruled in a decision that gave a detailed definition of the term science, the court declared that creation science is not, in fact, a science. What that meant is that people were teaching high school, like me at that time, that meant I couldn't teach creation. It was a religion. You know, I, I, could teach, I could teach evolution because it fit the definition of science. Now, that, that court case was challenged by two teachers. One of them challenged it on the basis that he had the right to teach because of freedom of speech. He could do what he wanted to in his class. Well, he lost that case. And he lost it very simply because he was trying to teach creation in a public school that doesn't allow religion to be taught in a public school. He lost. He should have known better to bring the case. And then another guy challenged it. He challenged it on the idea that, well, I'll make my own curriculum. I'll show those guys. <laughs> well, of course, what happened is the school board said, hey, fella, you don't make the curriculum in this place. We make it. And he lost the case, too. Now, I hope that makes you understand why the creationists want to get to the seventh grade. They want to get to the seventh grade because that's the only place you can talk to school boards who don't know anything about evolution. Let me explain this to you. When I'm going to use a textbook, what do I use? I use one like this one. Now, this textbook is uh, a pretty basic text. It could be used in the University of Florida, University of Michigan, and any, any large school in the United States. It's small schools. As a matter of fact, uh, I looked at the textbooks that are used here at Embry Riddle University. They're great. One of the evolution, one of the um, ecology books here has one of the best chapters on evolution I've ever seen. It's a great book. Anyway, this is what I had to use. And if you think about it a second, all the facts in here have to be able to stand scientific scrutiny. Somebody is looking at these babies, you know? Well, here's what you find out. There is not a school in the United States that does scientific research that accepts creationism. Not one major college or university in the United States accepts creationism or intelligent design. Matter of fact, let me say it a different way. I really checked, I mean, I, I really looked, and I couldn't find a major college or university in the world that accepted creation or intelligent design. Now, I, I thought, 
a teacher. I've got to find out about this stuff. So where do these guys get their ideas? So I ordered some Bob Jones textbooks. This is a Bob Jones life science book. They use it in the eighth grade. It has 500 pages in it. It has 250 references to biblical verses to explain science. It has not one, not one reference to a scientific journal or book. It uses the term God 380 times, Satan three times, and hell twice. <clears throat> Here's the biology book that Bob Jones puts out for high school students. It has 692 pages, 350 references to biblical verses to prove science. Not one reference to any scientific journal or scientific book. It mentions God 600 times and Satan 40 times. This book is printed right here in Florida. You know it's a creation book because it says so. Biology, God's living creation. It's a creation book. This company claims that they are the largest textbook publishers for creation of schools in the United States. Now remember, we're talking creation of schools. These things would never be allowed in a public school because they're religious. This book has 650 pages in it, 150 references to the Bible, no science references at all to any book, any article, anything. It mentions God 425 times. Well, I'd like to ask a question. <laughs> You know, when I come before a group like this, uh, and, I, and, I, and I, I want to show you that I've tried to keep up with things, I mean, I read the Scientific American, and I, and I trust the Scientific American. Uh, I get a, a book that's specially put out for teachers uh, called the National Center for Science Education. You know, it has a lot in it about, about evolution and creation. I trust that book. I, I go to the bookstore and get, and get Discovery. I trust that too. And I trust the National Geographic. They've been at it a hundred years. They know how old the earth is. So I'm looking out at this audience. You look like a really great group. Lots of college students and lots, lots of creationists in here. I'd like to know where I stand before I go any further. How many of you folks would like to see Embry-Riddle University be the first university in the world to accept creation and intelligent design in their science department. Can I show of hands? <laughs> Thank you very much. That's, that's ex exactly what I expected. You know? um, okay, now, I wanna sh I w I'm, I'm often asked, well, how, how do you handle the stuff with, with the students as far as the, the, the evidence is collected? Well, let me just li give you a list of things here that are the, the pieces of equipment that scientists use to study evolution. Computers, ultrasound, core boring, sonar, lasers, deep sea vessels, chromatography, electron microscopes, DNA sequencing, ultraviolet light, radioactive dating, uh, television, electrophoresis, x-rays, robotics, spectroscopes, photography, and Geiger counters. Those pieces of equipment are used in chemistry, physics, geology, and evolution. We get the same results they do. There are people in here that I imagine would not want a crime to be solved because you wouldn't believe the evidence that was collected by using these methods. These are the methods that evolution uses. Professors, you'll have an additional five minutes to rebuttal uh, Dr. Hoven's uh, opening statement and to pose question or a question to him. Uh, I, I am curious about uh, uh, your presentation, which was, you know, I'm, I, I am impressed. The uh, only one I've heard uh, uh, speak that quickly was a, a Texas auctioneer, but uh, uh, I, I, I tried really hard to concentrate and get it off. Uh, the earth was created 6,000 years ago in six days by God. I am confused. Being philosophically consistent and being a very honest person, I'm sure you can tell me where God came from. 
And it, in, addition, in addition, once you've told me where God comes from, uh, please try to clarify how you can figure that a spiritual force can have an impact on a material universe to create it. I think that some years ago we already talked about that kind of thing in uh, philosophical circles at any rate by posing the question, if angels are made of uh, spiritual matter and a pen is made of material matter and spiritual matter displaces no space, how many angels can dance on the tip of a pen? <laughs> I have a sense of sort of uh, uh, reversal experience here, but but please do go ahead. You got five minutes. Now I just want to know which question. That's all you right. Want. You may take the rest of the minutes. We're supposed to do one question at a time. Which one would you like? That was part of the format for the debate. So which which? I question? want you to fill in the story of the rest of the uh, beginning of the universe. God, spiritual matter, impact on material matter. Okay. So two questions. All right. Go ahead. All right, your question, where did God come from, assumes that you're thinking of the wrong, uh, obviously it displays that you're thinking of the wrong God, <laughs> because the God of the Bible d is not affected by time, space, or matter. If he's, if he's affected by time, space, or matter, he's not God. Time, space, and matter is what we call a continuum. All of them have to come into existence at the same instant, because if there were matter but no space, where would you put it? If there were matter and space but no time, when would you put it? You cannot have time, space, or matter independently. They have to come into existence simultaneously. The Bible answers that in ten words. In the beginning, there's time. God created the heaven, there's space, and the earth, there's matter. So you have time, space, matter created, a trinity of trinities there. Just, you know, time is past, present, future. Space has length, width, height. Matter has solid, liquid, gas. You have a trinity of trinities created instantaneously. And the God who created them has to be outside of them. If he's limited by time, he's not God. The guy who created this computer is not in the computer. He's not running around in there changing the numbers on the screen, okay? The God who created this universe is outside of the universe. He's above it, beyond it, in it, through it. He's, he's unaffected by it. So for... And the, the concept that a, a spiritual uh, force cannot have any effect on a material body, well then I guess you'd have to explain to me things like emotions and love and hatred and envy and jealousy and, and rationality. I mean, if your brain is just a random collection of chemicals that form by chance over billions of years, how on earth can you trust your own reasoning processes and the thoughts that you, you think? Okay? So, um, I, your, your, your question, where did God come from, is assuming a limited God, and that's your problem. The God that I worship is not limited by time, space, or matter. If I could fit the infinite God in my three-pound brain, he would not be worth worshiping, that's for certain. So that's the God that I worship. Thank you. Dr. Hoover, would you like to for that? <laughs> would you please present a question to the other side? I was curious about the previous... Uh, presentation, uh, he said he trusted National Geographic, just to give you one example, okay? Um, the Bible teaches clearly that the birds were made on the fifth day, and the reptiles were made on the sixth day, okay? Evolution teaches exactly the opposite, reptiles first and then birds. The Bible says birds first, then reptiles. Actually, everything about the evolution theory is backwards to what the Bible teaches. Somebody's clearly wrong on this. This guy says dinosaurs are alive as birds, scientist says, okay? Well, this is absurd, obviously. Nobody's ever seen any animal produce a different kind of animal. They can believe that if they want. Here's a USA Today. Missing link discovered October 1999. National Geographic, one that he trusts. Missing link. Breaking news, folks. We have found National Geographic, November 1999, the missing link. A few months later, oops, it was a mistake. Some Chinese guy had taken a couple of fossils and glued them together and fooled everybody. <laughs> National Geographic paid, I think, $80,000 for that fossil. It was incredible the amount of money they paid for that. And there's all kinds of it. I can show you over and over where National Geographic is not trustworthy. The entire argument that I heard a few minutes ago was majority opinion supports evolution. Okay, first place, I don't think that's true. Okay, how many of you in here tonight at a secular university do not believe the evolution theory that they present? Okay, how many do believe the evolution theory that they present? Okay, we could take a count here. 
I suspect that was majority for the creation side. We can count if you like, but I know this. About 9% of the population in Gallup polls and surveys taken says they believe in atheistic evolution, no God is involved. 90% say yes, there was a God involved, and 50% of the entire population says God did it in the last 10,000 years. So if you're using majority opinion, uh, as your argument, I think that's obviously, historically, you can prove that's pretty easy to prove wrong. Uh, majority opinion proves nothing. Majority's often been wrong. So all of the experts on birds are saying the dinosaurs could not possibly have turned to birds. There are just millions and millions of differences. So I guess I'd be curious, with all the evidence that we've gathered over the years, why you would think a dinosaur turned into a bird. When dinosaurs, uh, reptiles produce reptiles, birds produce birds. I mean, right, there's please. no evidence of this. So my question, why do you think dinosaurs turned to birds if you think that? Evolution is a, a process where all kinds of DNA and all kinds of animals are making changes. Some of that changes in DNA are going to turn out to be pretty good. Some of them aren't. Uh, if we take a look at an example uh, from your research uh, saying that, um, hmm, how about, how about uh, Noah's Ark having one kind of animal that evolved into dogs, foxes, and wolves. In 6,000 years, not possible at all. It not, couldn't even begin to happen in 6,000 years. Noah's Ark, one kind of horse developing into a zebra and a donkey, not possible. No, there's no way DNA can change that fast. What evolutionists are saying is the, DNA, the process of DNA changing takes a long time. You see, the creationists want it both ways. They want to make fun of evolution and saying, well, why does that thing want to do that? Well, it doesn't want to do it. DNA is changing randomly. But at the same time, they want to say that you can have all kinds of animals evolve in 6,000 years just hopped off of a ship someplace that Noah's running. It's impossible. There is absolutely no way that that amount of DNA could change in 6,000 years. The only way you can solve that is by saying the usual way. It must have been a miracle. Well, in science, we don't talk about miracles. We talk about evidence. And that's what's important to us. And I kind of resent Dr. Hovine telling us this is what we believe and this is what I predict. Um, my prediction, my prediction is, is that evolution has been going on for a long time and it will continue to go on and it will go on in the same way it's always developed. DNA changed bit by bit, little by little, and plants and animals will change. I have a, a couple of <laughs> creationist magazines at home that, tell, that told me in the creationist magazine that the reason that we have thorns on blackberries and roses and the reason we have a toothache is because Adam and Eve fell from grace when they sinned. I have a hard time accepting that as scientific evidence. I would rather use as my scientific evidence tracing the origin of, of thorns and, and the origins of teeth back to their beginning rather than relying, relying on the fact that Adam and Eve sinned and that brought a disaster into the world. I'm done. Professors, would you like to formulate a question or uh, another statement? You do have two minutes. Do we have more time? Do we have more time? Y you will in after five minutes. How many? Uh, after Mr. Hoven goes. I, I didn't hear what he said. I, 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 we can understand. I'm sorry. You'll have five more minutes after Mr. Hoven has his five minutes. So what minutes. were the two minutes that you said that we had time right now? Is it on the board, one minute and 47 seconds. And we just talked about it. And who has that time right now? You do. Any, any, any three one of, of you. us. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Just trying to get the I'm sorry. Uh, image straight. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I do uh, uh, wonder about my earlier question. I don't feel uh, comfortable about it being uh, answered. That is, you uh, keep uh, insisting that the God of the Bible, in some way, is responsible for all this. You may, even if you were to prove that there's some kind of spiritual force, it is not necessarily the God of the Bible. So you're taking a giant leap there. So I think there's a lot of that uh, has to do with lots of faith that has to be developed in there. And I see that from our group here. And I think Mark Twain said about faith that uh, faith is believing something you know ain't true. Uh, that's, that's, I, I, I don't think you can rely on faith. I, don't, I think you need to, if you want to be honest, intellectually honest, you've got to come up with some, something a little bit more solid than just to buy in 
to the fact that 80% of U.S. Americans are God believers and uh, only 14% are not. <coughs> so I'm, I'm, I don't know. Is, is that, can he answer that? Or? Absolutely. All right, that'd be nice. Well, what was the question? Phrase the question again, please. I, I didn't, you didn't really get, you made a statement. I didn't hear, hear a question there. What, what do you want to hear? Okay, my original question was for you to show uh, where the deity comes from. And uh, you keep insisting that it is the uh, God of the Bible. But uh, that is another leap of faith that uh, seems to be part of that. Can you sort of trot that out a little bit more? And uh, let, let me say one thing also about the, uh, the story that you gave about the uh, uh, National uh, Geographic, the, or, or was it the Scientific American, with the, uh, <clears throat> the bird and uh, dinosaur thing. It shows that the scientific community is working. These people are in dialogue. Error may occur where reason is left free to correct it. And in your system, it's nailed down by the Bible, and no, I cannot challenge that. Uh, with the invention of all kinds of uh, strange beings, I just looked, th this is very much news to me, I looked at one of the books that uh, Jim has here, uh, where the assertion is that evolution is inspired by Satan. And uh, what now, we have Thank God, you, sir, we we're gonna Satan, have to and, cut uh, you off, and you can be right. back in five minutes. Carry on. I guess I'm still a little baffled what the question was. Uh, if your question, if you're going back to, you didn't like my answer of how God did it, God was just, uh, God is outside of time, space, matter. I think you need to stop and look at the theory that you uh, are believing in, apparently, because there are so many thousands of unanswered questions. See, it's much easier for me to believe in the beginning God than to believe, believe in the beginning dirt or matter. The evolutionist does not answer the question. There's six different types of evolution, as I shared clearly earlier. Um, if the Big Bang Theory is true, then I would like to know what exploded and where did it come from and where did the energy come from and where did the space come from for the matter to expand into and where did the organization come from and where did the information come from? There's a whole host of questions that are a whole lot harder for you to answer than in the beginning God. Where does it, where's information come from? Man, is, this universe is not just random molecules circulating around. I mean, it, it, it carries information. Just like a book is so much more than ink on a paper, it carries information. And the DNA is more than just chemicals. It's information. So the evolutionist never answers the question, where did this information come from? Where did the energy come from? Where did the matter itself come from? And you gripe about my belief. I, I believe by faith in the beginning God. I know I, I admit I don't understand that. But you believe hundreds of things by faith. You don't even understand that you're believing by faith. You think matter is either eternal or can create itself. What's the two choices? How did matter get here? The world is here. How, where did the matter come from? Did it just happen by itself? Or is it all just imaginary? We're not really here at all. You're faced with the option of, we're not really here. This is all just our imagination. Or it had a beginning. Or matter is eternal, which is in both, both of the second two options are in violation of the obvious laws of thermodynamics. Matter doesn't create itself. And everything degrades over time, so either it had a beginning or it didn't. If it had a beginning, then what was before the beginning? I mean, there's so many thousands of things you take by faith. You say, I say in the beginning, God, and you say, well, this matter somehow either was always here or created itself, and then this matter somehow became alive, and then this first living thing learned how to reproduce, and then it learned how to make something other than its kind. I mean, even though nobody's ever seen that, nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. Or You mentioned about you know, the dog, fact that a wolf and a, co a fox and a dog coming from a common ancestor in, off Noah's Ark in only 4,400 years. For heaven's sake, you believe they came from a rock. I mean, come on. I don't think my theory is that silly at all. So. Uh, if my answer to your question is still the same, I believe in the beginning God, I do take that by faith. Here's the major difference, major difference that I don't think you're going to understand. I admit mine is a religion. They do not admit theirs is a religion. They want you to think what they believe is science and all of you should pay for their religion to be taught in this university. And that's the situation we have today, and that's unfortunate. There have always been situations where the majority taught something. I mean, in the Soviet Union 15 years ago, if you stood up and said, hey, kids, I don't believe in communism. I think capitalism is a better system. You would be in Siberia if you survived. And here in Emory University, 
If you stood up in your classroom and said, I don't believe this evolution theory is true, I think it's pretty obvious there must have been a designer to this system, you would be in intellectual Siberia. You would lose your job. It has happened to hundreds of teachers, just simply for standing up and saying, look, I think the evidence is here, folks. There must have been a designer. If I asked you to explain how computers came to be, but you cannot use man as your answer, I only want a purely naturalistic explanation for the origin of computers. Purely naturalistic. The answer has to lie within the computer. How did these molecules get together? How did this data get together? How did these plastic molecules come together and the, the, the different uh, silicone chips? How did it happen? Your answer has to lie in the computer. I've already eliminated the only obvious answer to the problem at the beginning by my definition. They're trying to eliminate the only answer, the only logical answer to the question by their definition of science. They want to define science as things that we can observe and test and demonstrate in the natural world. Okay, well then that eliminates both evolution and creation. Both are unobserved. We don't see anything change. We don't see anything created from nothing. Here's the problem. Both creation and evolution are religious. I admit mine's a religion. They don't admit theirs is a religion. And all of us are paying for their religion to be taught in the school system. And I, for one, resent that. So my answer is still the same, God did it. Your question for them, quickly please. Okay, my question for them. Uh, I have several thousand questions I guess I'd like to ask. Uh, does your textbook you're holding in front of you that you said you trust, here at, used at this university, does the, your textbook teach that there are vestigial structures? If you can maybe just look in the index under the word vestigial. I'm going to take, did I get five minutes? Or just ask a question? Yeah, just a question. You already had your five. Okay. Does your textbook teach that the appendix is vestigial and is no longer needed, even though all doctors know the appendix is not vestigial? It has been proven to be part of the immune system. If your appendix is taken out, you can live, just like you can live without both your arms and both your eyes. It doesn't prove you don't need it. So just a simple question. Does your textbook teach the kids that there are vestigial structures and that is therefore evidence for evolution? I think you have that in one of your posters here, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it does teach that there's vestigial structures. <laughs> Professors, between the three... It you... doesn't teach that there's a God, though. <laughs> you have five minutes. I don't, I don't get the point. Uh, uh, that, that's the way that's the way DNA works. <laughs> there are there are certain changes in the DNA molecules that will make some organs more efficient and some less efficient. That's just the way it is. You can find the vestigial structures on plants also. Um, if we have you and I have no control over what goes on in the DNA in our body. We just pass it on to our offspring. But to uh, to say that. Uh, to make one example like that and say that it's going to get rid of the theory of evolution is ridiculous. We've got all these other proofs that, uh, about evolution. Vestigial structures are just one tiny part of that. Uh, okay, let me, uh, let, me ask you, let me say another thing. Um, I know where God came from. Man made him. <laughs> I also know where your computer came from, you know, from science. It was put together by people that understood physics and chemistry. It was put together by people that understood molecules and atoms. It was put together by people with intelligence, people that knew how to love and hate and, and carry on biological relationships because they have intelligence. We got intelligence because we have brains. We've got brains because we've got DNA. It doesn't make any sense at all to say that or that people that don't have religion, don't have feelings, don't follow the law. The constitution of our country does not mention God or religion. It's a, we are a nation of laws. We're a nation of laws because we're a nation of people that have intelligence. That's the way it is. That's the way animals operate. Some animals evolved a different way. They evolved so they could fly or they could crawl or they could run. And what was successful for them worked out for them. What's successful for us is that we have a good brain. And it's, and, it, and we'll have to wait and see what happens. Not in our lifetimes, but all animals are in the same boat. All plants are in the same boat. Sometimes when people were, were doing this kind of stuff, people are always thinking about human beings. You can find the evolutionary theory in any, any part of life. 
it doesn't matter if you're talking about maple trees. I, I still want an answer to the question of how did uh, all these different things evolve in just 6,000 years um, when it isn't possible. It's mathematically not possible. If it were, by now, farmers would have bred a different species. When he says something like, well, you breed dogs, you always get dogs. Well, of course you do, because you can't change them in 6,000 years. If you could, farmers would have bred something different. We've been breeding ant plants and animals for 4,000 years. We can't do it, simply because it takes too long. The earth is old enough for evolution to have taken place, but we haven't had enough time to get different kinds of animals starting from Noah's Ark. Uh, Rhino, you want to say something? <laughs> we have a minute again? Yeah, we got a minute and a half, I guess. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I do. Uh, uh, one thing that sort of uh, uh, crossed my mind as you were speaking is uh, the difference between science and religion. Uh, and uh, it seems to me there is a very clear-cut difference. Uh, uh, science is uh, self-correcting in the sense that uh, uh, the battle of uh, disagreement will edit out that which is wrong and uh, uh, by essentially falsifiability. That is, in other words, if a scientist uh, 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 advances a particular idea, uh, he also can tell uh, what particular conditions uh, must be the case for him to retract that idea. And this is something that is absent in religion. That is, religion is seeking uh, truth, absolute truth, and charges science with not finding truth, which it isn't trying. Science works with probability and with self-correction. Religion, ultimately, I know I am right and uh, I'm not allowing anything else. This is what is so devastating to try to talk to anybody who is a person of faith. You can't get anywhere because they'll weasel out just about anything you try to, uh, uh, to offer by inventing new and new and different interpretations and new passages of the Bible and whatnot. And everybody else, of course, is wrong, except the one person is looking at it. That kind of uh, uh, system, I think, cannot be possibly uh, uh, science. Well, he said science is self-correcting. I agree. I happen to like science quite a bit. But see, the creation view doesn't have to be constantly corrected because it's right. Okay? Um, and you... I like the answer uh, that uh, the one gentleman gave. He said, obviously, the computer is here because of man, because of intelligence. I mean, obviously, this took a designer. Well, duh. <laughs> so did the universe. So did the single cell in your body. So did every living creature. I mean, you can't explain the computer inside the computer, can you? And you can't explain the creation inside the creation. There has to be something above an intelligent designer. Oh, and you talk about uh, devastating to talk to a person of faith. What you said a few sentences earlier was, or what the other gentleman said was, of course we don't see changes. Farmers have been raising dogs for, you know, 4,000 years, and we don't see changes because it takes too long. If you don't see faith in there, I can't help you, okay? You are relying on the unseen. Oh, yes, long ago and far away, Evolution has got to be the biggest fairy tale for adults ever created. Everything you said required faith. Well, we see dogs produce dogs, but if you give them billions of years, uh, well, okay, you just left science and went to religion and didn't even see it. You didn't even see what happened in your mind. And one of you teaches a course on logic. I mean, if this was a student of yours doing this, you'd give them an F. And yet your fellow professors believe it and you, get, you think it's great. They jump from faith to science back and forth all the time. Well, we see dogs produce dogs, but if we had enough time, oh, stop, 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 you're leaving science right that moment. So, if I got three minutes, let me just cover a couple things that I resent being in the textbooks, and I would like to hear if this is in your textbook. My question is, is this in your textbook? And after I show you with you the evidence, I want to know why, okay? This textbook says many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. Earlier, it was mentioned one of the evidences for evolution is vestigial organs. Andrew Carnegie left behind millions of dollars to start an organization called the National Center for Science Education, of which you are a part, okay? The National Center for Science Education, I was in Berkeley last week. 147 professors at Berkeley refused to debate me. Jeannie Scott won't debate me for any amount of money on the planet. Here's Jeannie Scott right here. I'll fly out at my expense and take them all on. 
This is welcome to the home page of National Center for Science Education, a tax exempt nonprofit membership organization working to defend the teaching of evolution against sectarian attack. We are a nationally recognized clearinghouse for information and advice to keep evolution in the classroom and scientific creationism out. The National Center for Science Education is a little bitty storefront building in Berserkley, California. I was there four days ago, and they got five people working in this little building. And they, they teach that maybe the cow evolved into the whale. That's what their literature teaches. This textbook says the whale has a pelvis and a leg bone. Whales have hind limb bones that have no function. Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. These are the bones they're talking about right there. Just imagine the whale walking around. I'm sorry, I tried and I can't, okay? They say the whale's pelvis has no apparent function. The whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling mammals. This is simply a lie, okay? Those little bones are anchor points that special muscles attach to that allow the whales to reproduce. This has nothing to do with whales walking on land. It has to do with making baby whales. So either the authors of this textbook are ignorant about whale anatomy and certainly shouldn't be talking about it, or they're deliberately lying to you and desperate for evidence for their theory. So my question is very simple. Does your textbook teach the whale has a vestigial pelvis? If so, why would you use a biology book in your biology class at a, at a famous university like this based on an author that doesn't even understand his basic anatomy of whales and he's either lying to the students or he's ignorant? Why why would you use something like that? And how could a vestigial structure be evidence for evolution when that's an example of losing, not gaining? It doesn't tell you how the whale got the legs. Oh, it's slowly losing them. Well, in the first place, it's not slowly losing them, okay? It's a lie. Secondly, even if it was, that's the opposite of evolution. How on earth can this be evidence for a theory? Yes, boys and girls, we're slowly losing things. That's how we got it all. Well, duh. So. My question is simple. Does your book teach there are vestigial structures, specifically the whale having a vestigial pelvis? If it does, why would you use a book like that in a university like this? Excuse me, sir, just a uh, quick reminder. We, uh, I'll turn your mic on in just a second. <laughs> We're going to go to an intermission in uh, one more iteration. So, uh, yes, absolutely. Your table, your table. Uh, we're going to go on intermission after that. Ed, the book does not teach that the whale has a vestigial pelvis. That's one of the most ignorant statements I've ever heard. Uh, the pelvis is an absolute necessary thing for the whale. He attaches all of his muscles to it. It's one of the major things that helps him swim. Uh, I happen to be keeping up with what's going on with the evolution of the whale. And we have a very good set of bones saved from fossil records showing that the whales evolved through a long period of time from animals that were on land to animals that are in the water. We have that evidence. And for to say we don't have it or to say that we're lying is disingenuous to this audience. I, I ask you, don't believe, don't believe me. Let, let, let me get off the subject a second. Right up there are the things we try to do in science. We say, let's not believe revelation. If somebody just says, I know because I know, I, no, no, that's not good enough. Believe authority. No, let's not believe authority. Let's not believe any of us up here at the table. You folks can get the copy of this book or this thing here and get the facts. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe him. You can find out for yourself. You don't have to trust authorities, even me. The second thing is tradition. You don't have to trust tradition. I mean, what the, I mean come on, there's tradi different traditions all over the world. But we can trust science because science should be the same all over the world. What I'm trying to say to you is when I teach my classes, evidence is what's important. I have no evidence that God exists. I have no evidence that there was a Noah's Ark. I have no evidence that there was an Adam and Eve. I have evidence that whales evolved from animals that live on land, and I can prove it. Well, we, we do have, I haven't had anything to say. Uh, there's a lot of talking going on, and that's unusual for me. Uh, but uh, the, the one thing that we can prove uh, by the great philosophical statement, uh, cogito ergo sum in Latin, which says, I think, therefore I am. Now what that says is that I exist and prove 
that I am there because I can think. But it doesn't necessarily say that you exist. I can't prove that you exist, but I can prove that I exist. And I also know that I'm here. And, I'm and, and I do believe in you. There's a high probability that I do believe in you. And you are here. And somehow you got here. And somehow this happened probably in the last time between 10 and 20 billion years ago, probably to the record uh, of the Earth, which was maybe four to six billion years ago. And basically all of this biological stuff is very interesting and it does prove to how science brings about to cause things to happen. But it's so complicated, it is so, so uh, complicated that, that it, you, you, can, you can confuse the process by misinterpreting the results. We do have, as my colleagues say, the scientific method. And it, it based on the best information that we can put together to form to what we know is true. It doesn't mean that we know the truth. It means we have maybe some probability of the truth. And that may be the best that we will always have. But to talk about, start talking about chickens and dinosaurs, and I like eating chickens because chickens are descendants of dinosaurs, and every time I eat a chicken, it makes me happy. <laughs> because I think a lot of them ate our ancestors a long time before that, about 160 uh, million years ago. So, <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to leave with my colleagues and with the fact that we are exist, we do think, and we are here, and, and how the record got as to how got to be here could be debated. We do have information. We, we probably miss more information than we, than we know. But I will say this, that uh, we've got to be very careful uh, as to how we interpret the record Time, when please. we're trying to, to talk about something because we are, we are subject to ourselves to, to, to sink into uh, confusion and to basically involve yourself into what becomes voodoo science. And, and that is very, very dangerous. Okay, let me cover uh, five main points here. He said, we have evidence of whales evolving from land animals. In the first place, this is absolutely incorrect, okay? If he's talking about Ambulocetus, you need to study here. This was made mostly of imagination. If that's your evidence, you need to study the Ambulocetus a little better, okay? Uh, there is overwhelming evidence that Ambulocetus is just an un unusual animal or just an animal that may be still existing someplace. There were just a few bones found and a whole lot of plaster of Paris and imagination used to put it together. Um, Basilosaurus is not an intermediate. The serpentine form of the body and peculiar serrated cheek teeth made it plain that these uh, uh, animals could not possibly have been ancestral to any modern whales. This is from uh, uh, one of the experts on invertebrate history here. The evolutionary hist origin of whales remains controversial among zoologists, Compton's Encyclopedia a couple years ago. Pachycetus, pictured here, is made from one small piece of a skull, a few piece of jaw, a small piece of jaw, and a few teeth. You find a piece of the skull, a few teeth, and a piece of the jaw, and that's proof it's intermediate between a whale and a cow? You have got to be kidding. I'm sure this is one of the ones in his fossil proof for evolution, and you're missing such a major point. I don't know if I can help if you can't get this, but no fossil, no fossils count as evidence for evolution. In a court of law, they would laugh at you because you bring some bones in and say, Your Honor, this is the ancestor of whales. Well, first place, there's not enough to tell what it is. Secondly, you don't know that that is the ancestor of anybody. You don't know that that animal had any kids that lived. It is absolutely impossible to use any fossils at all as evidence for evolution.
And anybody that's telling you fossils or evidence for evolution, you talk about voodoo science, that is it, folks, okay? We know these bones produce something other than their kind. Even though no animal today can do this, these bones were able to do it. That's absolute voodoo science. That's a good word. For, I've got to use that one from now on. I appreciate that, okay? <laughs> and if we could rewind the tape, we would hear you said many times, well, probably it happened. We're here, so uh, that proves we're here, so that proves evolution. Man, you talk about voodoo science and absolute insanity and logic. We're here, I agree. That doesn't, have, that doesn't offer any support for the evolution theory. Yes, I agree we're here. I, I happen to like being here, okay? Uh, so, and then you said something I think the average audience may miss if you're not careful here. He said, well, it's so complicated and the implication that I get, because I get this all the time, I've had done many debates at universities, and I, I don't, I, I've never had a class in debate, I don't understand how the rules are, and I don't know all about all this timekeeping stuff. All I know is, I think the evidence is, is overwhelmingly obvious. There must have been a designer, okay? And I'm here to defend the biblical view of creation as the only logical scientific choice. And I'm here to tell people I resent everybody's tax dollars going to pay for this voodoo science of evolution to be taught in this university and other universities around the world. Beer is often sold at football games, but beer has absolutely nothing to do with football. Okay? Beer does not become athletic by association. And just because evolution is mixed into a science book, that does not make evolution part of science. It's just mixed in the book, and I'm sorry about that. Okay, I'm trying to fix it. But he said it's so complicated, we don't want to confuse, um, confuse the people or something to that effect. I don't remember the exact quote here. To me, what, what that's trying to imply is they're smart, you're too dumb to understand, and anybody that doesn't believe in evolution is simply dumb. And if you, if you just would study this for 100 hours like I have, then you'd believe like I do. And since you don't believe like I do, <coughs> you haven't studied enough, and you're dumb. That's the implication I'm getting. Is anybody else getting that from this tonight? Okay, no. We do exist. We are here. I agree. And that is your evidence for evolution? You gotta be kidding. All of the evidence of evolution from whales, first place, no fossils count. None. Think about it. No fossils can possibly count for evidence. And the fossils they find are little fragments here and there, and they are putting their imagination and interpretation on those fossils. Look, when you find a bunch of, you, there is no such thing as a fossil record. How they teach that blows my mind. They say, well, in the fossil record, I say, well, what fossil record? There is no fossil record. There are a bunch of bones in the dirt. There's a bunch of bones in the dirt. I agree, I happen to have a huge fossil collection myself. But those bones don't have dates on them. They don't come with a little tag saying this one evolved into this one. All you do is put your preconceived evolutionary imagination idea on top of these fossils that are found. See, the creationists and the evolutionists are both looking at the same evidence. We both see the fossils. I see that as example of death. They see that as an example of, wow, that's how we got ahead. All these animals died, isn't that wonderful? No, that's proof there was a big flood, because fossils just don't normally form except under special conditions, and billions and billions of fossils are found. That's, to me, that's evidence of the Bible. I see it that way. Thank you. The first question will be posed to the evolutionist side. The question is, is the Big Bang Theory a reasonable scientific theory? Please explain. You'll have seven minutes. Mr. Hoven will have three minutes to rebuttal, and then we will go on to completely independent question. Is the Big Bang Theory a reasonable scientific theory Please explain. Thank you. Uh, yes, I will. Uh, I will answer the uh, the issue for the team. Uh, yes, the uh, the Big Bang theory is viable, but it's one of two theories about the existence of the uh, of the uh, universe. One of which was a constant energy uh, universe that said that basically. Um, uh, simply exists and energy is somehow generated with, within itself inside. There is no scientific uh, evidence to show that that particular theory of the universe uh, has ever uh, been proven or, or shown any evidence to, to show. The Big Bang Theory uh, does have a, sea, a, a piece of evidence that uh, Wilson and Conzio from Bell Labs got a uh, Nobel Prize for discovering uh, the fact that there was uh, uh, radiation throughout the entire universe is in all particular directions believed to be the, uh, the remnants of the explosion of the energy in the birth of uh, the universe. 
and uh, their antennas would basically, they could point, no matter how they pointed the antennas in any, any direction, uh, they discovered uh, that the intensity of radiation in that particular uh, direction was the same, which uh, was, was essentially proof, a proof of, the, of a piece of data that showed that there may have been something that, uh, that made the, the Big Bang Theory. So that, we, we, we have that. The scientific uh, evidence right now is that um, the Big Bang Theory is um, the best knowledge that we have. It is believed. There are some very strange things about it. Uh, it starts essentially with there was a void. Now the void is, it wasn't a hole or a box with nothing in it. It basically didn't even have space. It was nothing. And somehow um, a black hole the size of an atom became unstable and exploded. And it filled essentially into an area the size of an atom. 10 to the 6 more mass than we currently have in the existing universe. Uh, I find having something that packed together in how close we are here, uh, and if we believe in the conservation of mass principles and things of this nature, uh, all things have to be conserved. And the conserved the conservation has to exist either in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. And as such, we are here and know today the information and the knowledge had to have existed at the, at the beginning of the creation uh, of the universe. Now, you can, you, can, you can place anything that you wish about how this happened or who happened or how it happened or where it come from. I don't know how a God could come outside of our universe because there's nothing outside of our universe. It's a void. There's nothing. You can't go outside of our universe. Um, but we, um, uh, we do know that uh, the, the 10 to the billion years ago, that, that, that from the, the beginning of 10 billion years ago, we have the universe essentially to its time to date, the cooling of energy and the formation of stars and the formation of materials and eventually forming planets. And six, four to six billion years ago, uh, we had a crust around this particular planet and eventually some, some chemicals got together and, and we had uh, life. And, and the rest is here and we're here. And uh, I, can, I, I, I believe that and I believe it is so. And uh, all of the all of the absolute uh, details, uh, and there are many many details, um, uh, are, are probably less important to me than the fact that it did begin, and it does exist, and that we're here uh, today. I'm not I'm not fighting about with religion. I I'm a Christian. I have no I have no conflict with uh, with Christian beliefs my Christian beliefs, and, and with the scientific methods uh, that I also believe in as well. So, you know, I don't see anything that's contradictory to this. Uh, Luther, you're more... Uh, you, uh, am I on? Okay. You're more of an expert at this than I am, so I was just going to uh, uh, ask you to elaborate a little bit of uh, the possibility of getting some corroborative evidence of uh, uh, something like the Big Bang uh, through the uh, view of the Hubble back into uh, uh, time. Is that something that uh, might provide corroborative evidence for that? Uh, yes, the, the, the scientific record uh, is, is, is accumulating uh, substantially about our, our measurements and, and uh, essentially what is going on in the universe and uh, essentially what uh, what we know about uh, the mechanism of this. We're dealing with astronomical sizes and huge and huge and huge places. And if it started with uh, a little place the size of an atom, we do know that it has done, I can tell you one thing that we can all say that is true. Time has always gone forward 
and time goes forward with entropy into diversity, and diversity generates through time, it creates everything that's possible. And what we have today possible is what we have and what we are observing. Dr. Hoven, you will now have three minutes to uh, rebuttal that statement, and then I will ask you a completely independent question. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created based on the Big Bang Theory. Textbooks say 18 or 20 billion years ago, there was a, all the matter in the universe, which would be a lot of stuff, and by the way, the word universe means a single spoken sentence. Universe, single spoken sentence. God said. When he said there nothing can exist outside the universe, this is about like two computers talking to each other. Does man exist? Nothing exists outside the computer. We're it. Duh. Okay. Um, all the matter in the universe was in concentrated in one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. I think that's what we just heard a moment ago. Okay. This says, textbook says, after many billions of years, all the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area. This area will be no larger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then another Big Bang will occur. It happens every 80 to 100 billion years. Save the planet. We're going to get squished, folks, okay? This guy said, uh, nothing really means nothing. That's, that's brilliant, okay? Not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorize that from the state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. I believe that's what I just heard in the last few minutes, okay? This whole Big Bang idea started with a guy named George, or Isaac, uh, I mean, uh, Edward, George Latimer, who said the thing that exploded was a few light years in diameter. Well, at the least, that's about 12 trillion miles, okay? Then by 1965, they said, well, it was only 275 million miles. 1972, I think it was Scientific American, said, no, the thing that exploded, the Big Bang, came from something only 71 million miles in diameter. Later, they said, oh, no, it's only 54,000 miles. 1983, they said, the thing that exploded was a trillionth the diameter of a proton. Now, that's tiny, okay? And now they're saying nothing exploded. Here's Discover Magazine, two years ago. Where did everything come from? The universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero, nada. As it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. How is that possible? Ask Alan Guth. His theory will explain everything. Well, what does Alan Guth say? In Scientific American, Alan Guth says, the observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. That's a dot. He said it's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Folks, why would a sentence like this be found in Scientific American? There's nothing scientific about that state. It exhibits incredible faith. But the textbooks teach this, this dot was spinning. It spun faster and faster. Finally, it exploded. <laughs> the Big Bang. There are so many problems with the Big Bang. Simple physical science problems. What exploded? Where did the matter come from? Where did the energy come from? Where did the organization come from? Where did the information come from? Um, he, the, the story he gave was so good, I got to replay the tape and hear this, you know. 4.6 billion years ago, the planet developed a rocky crust. The chemicals got together, you know, blah, blah, blah. Here we are. Exactly what I said earlier. That's what the, that's what the theory teaches. Now, if he wants to believe that, that's fine. I don't care what you believe. But don't call that science. And don't make me pay to teach that to the rest of these kids in this university. These kids came here to learn some science, not a fairy tale like that. Thank you. Dr. Hoven, the next question will be posed to you. You'll have seven minutes, and then the evolutionists will have three minutes. Uh, the question's more of an open-end one. Uh, please prove, disprove, or generally talk about carbon dating and how it relates to evolution. <coughs> Get my projector on here. See, I have about 7,000 slides in PowerPoint, so it helps if you ask the questions in the same order that I have the answers. Uh, <laughs> carbon dating? Okay. Carbon dating, uh, actually fossils are dated by their position in the geologic column. They are not dated by carbon dating or potassium, argon, rubidium, strontium, lead 208, lead 206. None of those matter. A fossil is dated by the position in the geologic column. They're called index fossils. This guy admits it. Radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. The geologic column was invented in 19, 1830s. <clears throat> that was taught for 120 years and became accepted as science. And the geologic column doesn't exist any place on the planet. Okay, there is no geologic column. There are layers of rocks. And they're assuming that it's different ages. That's the problem right there. Uh, 
This guy says, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of, of dating and correlating the rocks in which they occur. We go through all kinds of examples on this, but on video seven. The Earth's atmosphere is about 100 miles thick. It is mostly nitrogen, 78%, 21% oxygen, a little bit of CO2 for plants to breathe, and very little radioactive carbon-14, 0.0000765%. This radioactive carbon-14 mixes with oxygen and it becomes carbon dioxide, most of it does, and the plants are breathing carbon dioxide. Now, carbon-14 is formed when radiation strikes the atmosphere. The nitrogen, which is the majority gas are up, up there and here, nitrogen, gets bombarded by cosmic rays and it bombards the upper atmosphere, producing fast-moving neutrinos. These neutrinos collide with atmospheric nitrogen, producing carbon-14. That's how it's made. If you look at a, a periodic table, carbon and nitrogen are right next to each other. Nitrogen is normally an atomic weight of 14 and carbon is an atomic weight of 12. But if the nitrogen gets blasted with these neutrinos, it turns into carbon-14, which is a rare, very rare, and radioactive element. It is radioactive just like uranium or any other radioactive element, and you can hear it as it decays or breaks apart and throws off all the little particles into, the, into space around it. Now, carbon-14 is being produced by the sun, or by the neutrinos, by the high-speed radiation, long, doesn't matter. It breaks back down to nitrogen. About half of it breaks down every 5,730 years. Okay, this is estimated to be the half-life. Obviously, nobody watched it for 5,700 years. But during photosynthesis, plants are breathing in CO2. And so the animals eat the plants and make it part of their body. So you and I probably have carbon-14 in us because at some time in your life, you have either eaten plants or you've eaten animals that have eaten plants. That's about all there is, okay? So these plants are absorbing things uh, out of the atmosphere. They're absorbing the carbon-14. It becomes part of their tissue. It is assumed the ratio of C14 to normal C12 in the atmosphere would be the same ratio found in living plants and animals. If the atmosphere is 0.0000765%, it is assumed plants and animals have the same percentage. That has never been demonstrated, but that's a, that's a reasonable assumption, okay? When the plant or animal dies, it stops taking in new C14, so in theory you can tell how long it's been dead by measuring how much C14 is left. This entire process was invented by Willard Libby, Nobel Prize winner uh, for inventing carbon dating, uh, uh, University of Chicago in 1947 to 53. He worked on this, moved to Stanford University. Carbon-14 continues to decay after the animal dies. If half of it's gone, you would assume it's been dead 5,700 years. It can't get any more, obviously, so it's going to go out of balance. Carbon dating is actually a comparison of the carbon-14 in the object with the carbon-14 in the atmosphere. It's a ratio, okay? If it's 0 0.000765, it is still alive. If it's only 0 0000325, it's 5,700 years old, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The less it has, the older it is. This is how the theory works. It goes from a half to a fourth to an eighth to a sixteenth to not much, okay? They compare the amount of C14 in the object being dated with the amount in the atmosphere to estimate how long it's been dead. If only half of it has been, it's, if it's only got half as much, it's assumed it died 5,730 years ago. Sounds good, but there are some assumptions that mess up everything. If I told you to fill a barrel with water, but there were holes in the barrel, as you're putting water in, it's leaking out. It's kind of like a check checkbook, you know, you keep putting the money in, it keeps leaking out different places. But at some point, you're going to reach a stage called equilibrium. You'll never fill the barrel past that point unless you speed up the intake or cut down the outgo. The Earth's atmosphere is going to have the same problem. If you took a brand new planet Earth, created it, poof, and stuck it out going around the sun, 93 million miles away, it would start developing C14 from radiation and start losing it to decay. So the question is, they, they wondered this back in 1950, how long would it take Earth's atmosphere to reach equilibrium? The consensus was it would probably take about 30,000 years for the Earth to reach equilibrium. And then Willard Libby and the boys at the University of Chicago made a tragic mistake. They made two fundamentally, fatally flawed assumptions. They said, well, we know the Earth is millions of years old, mistake number one, so we can ignore the equilibrium problem. They ignored it. The problem is radiocarbon is still forming 28 to 37 percent faster than it's decaying, with carbon-14 as proof the Earth is less than 30,000 years old or else it would all be stabilized by now. It would be stable in the atmosphere, and it's not, okay? We could talk all day about that, but basically, if an animal is still alive, it should give you about 16 clicks on your Geiger counter. If it's only giving you eight, you're gonna say it's 5,700 years old. If it's only giving you four, it's 11,000 years old, et cetera, et cetera. This is how carbon dating is done. I won't have time to cover all of the uh, evidences I have, but I'll just give you a few examples of how it simply doesn't work. 
because one good experiment is worth a pound of theory any day. Back in 1949, when they developed it, the lower leg of a mammoth dated 15,000 years old, but the skin dated 21,000 years old. Same animal. It's not working in 1949. 1963, living mollusk shells dated 2,300 years old. It's still not working, folks. 1970, at the proceedings of the 12th Nobel Symposium, they said if a carbon date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. One part of a mammoth is 40,000 years old, another part is 26,000 from the same animal. Now, we could talk all day about carbon dating, but here's living snails, carbon dated 27,000 years old, 1984, Science Magazine. Uh, I don't have time to cover them all, but get, watch my video number seven, which is why it's out there. 1992. Two Colorado Creek mammoths in Alaska found side by side. One dated 22,000 years old, the other one was 16,000 years old. They're side by side. 1996, at Berkeley University, they used the most advanced dating techniques they have. They discovered these things that they thought were a quarter million years old actually were 53,000 to 27,000. Well, I'd, I'd like to point out, Your Honor, that is still a 96% error. If you think carbon dating proves the age of anything, you need your head examined. Thank you. I like a show of hands of how many understood that. <laughs> I guess we aren't the only liars here. Uh, <laughs> I, I have a pamphlet here uh, written by the Institute for Creation Research on radioactive isotopes. I'm quoting a, a sentence of the conclusion. Uh, they're, they're doing investigation on radioactive isotopes, and the thing is called uh, uh, RATE. And it says, we would appreciate your involvement in this effort. The most important contribution you can make is through prayer. We recognize this is a monumental task, and we need you to pray that we have wisdom as we work. Science would never pray for success. I wanted to find out why the evolutionists and the creationists disagreed on this carbon dating thing so much, so I went to one of the most famous creationists that I know. Henry Morris is the past president of the Institution of Creation Research. Um, in his pamphlet of the Creation Institute of Creation Research Society, in March 1982, page 226, he explains why only Dark carbon dating that shows a short time is effective. I quote, when God squeezed energy into atoms, he squeezed and held the atoms so tightly that there was no unstable elements and therefore no radioactivity. At the fall of Adam and Eve, he relaxed his grip slightly, which affected every atom. It allowed some to become unstable, that is, radioactive. It's all because of Adam and Eve's sin that we have unstable radioactivity. Isn't that right? Want to add anything to this? <laughs> we don't need that any more time. We're done. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me go ahead and pose the next question to you. I'd like to give uh, you guys an open ended one, too, for fairness sake. Uh, let me just read the question to you verbatim and then uh, please talk on this topic. The question says, uh, in evolution, there appears to be no real purpose to life. What hope do you have to offer me to even bother to continue to live? Uh, so I guess... I, no, what did you say? Uh, no for the sake of open-endedness, please, uh, I, I guess we're talking about morality, uh, purpose, anything along those lines. Well, let me, let me, let me point, uh, point out one thing, that this is, uh, 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 you know, sort of uh, confusing terms. Uh, there may not be a purpose uh, uh, ostensibly defined for the universe as a whole or for a society as a whole even. But that doesn't mean that an individual could not set up a purpose for him or herself. Uh, I, I'm going to live first, then I decide what's worthwhile for me to strive for in my life. If I simply subject myself to the mass and say because they don't have a purpose, I'm going to kill myself, there's something demented. I think I need counseling at that point for all practical purposes here. Uh, so here again, I think, I think uh, 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 purpose 
is something that we create individually for ourselves. It's not something that we deduce uh, from uh, uh, the nature of the universe in any way. I'm sure that everyone here has some kind of a purpose uh, in their existence. Defined by themselves, defined where they're going to go. So that, that would be my take on that. And that uh, did you want to? Sure. <laughs> Look at it. DNA changes. And it changes so that animals and plants survive. If the DNA changes in a brain of an animal, to make that animal breed successfully by taking care of its young, taking care of its brothers and sisters, and taking care of its family, that animal may survive. If, on the other hand, the DNA goes in a different direction, then the animal learns to swim or, or fly, that, can, that animal can survive. Certain animals have more emotions than others. We can measure the emotions in dogs. Anybody, anybody here want a dog that doesn't have any emotions? <laughs> you know, my two dogs have all kinds of emotions. I can tell when they're guilty and I can tell you know, when they're happy and I can tell when they're sad. It's, and it's good for them. They have the DNA in their brains that gave them the ability to be pack animals. And they survive because of it. Now, some animals, like cats, and how many cat owners in there know that cats aren't pack animals? They don't care if you're home or not. You know, dog owners know that dogs can't wait for you to get home. The cats survive because of the way they evolved. Human beings survive because of the way we evolved, too. So it's important to us to take care of our children. To it's important for us to make sure that our families survive. It's important for us to get mad once in a while. It's important for us to love. Those things have to be able to come out of us because we've got the right chemicals in our body to do that. If we didn't have those chemicals, we couldn't do it. So it's, it's uh, uh, anytime you talk about any kind of emotions, we've got them, and so do lots of other animals. If we want to talk, we can even talk about plants, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> if insects attack a maple tree, that maple tree gives off a chemical called a pheromone that goes out through the rest of the forest and unites with the leaves and the trees and the rest of the forest, those trees pick up that pheromone and then they produce a chemical to withstand the insect infection. That's important for those trees to be able to do that. It's important for them to be able to communicate with each other by using chemicals. It's important for us to do the same thing. But what we smell on each other is important. What we see on each other is important. Those things are controlled by DNA. Can you, could you, can you teach your child to love? Can you teach your child to hate? Sure you can. <laughs> but you can do it because those chemicals are there. We are an animal that has the ability to make our environment part of what, the, so we can survive. We can control our environment. We can control it because we've got intelligence. We can control it because we have emotions. We get those things. We get the basic cards we play with from DNA. Some of us get a better deck than the rest. Uh, what are you going to do about that? And the answer is, you can't do anything about it. You can try to fit into your environment. You can't make yourself something that you want to be just by wishing it. You've got, you are a, a sperm and an egg, you know? And that sperm and an egg developed from a lot of cells. Let me, um, <laughs> I, I want to ask you a, a question because, um, Another question, <laughs> because I hear, I hear this a lot, uh, and people are, are saying, well, how do you know about that evolution? You weren't there. How do you know that those things are really happening? You weren't there. Well, my question to you is, were you there when you were conceived? Do you remember then? <laughs> can, can you prove that you were conceived if you weren't there? Well, some of you are saying, well, that's a, 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 a silly question. Well, of course it's a silly question. And it's a silly question because we can look back in the past. We can trace back what happens to animals to make them behave a certain way. We can trace back to certain animals to make them to show what kind of characteristics they have. Uh, 
If you were to take a little chunk of skin right there from me and look at that hair follicle, then you were to take a, 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 a bird and, and take his wing and take that little follicle out right there, that's a, a feather follicle. Of course, if you took it from his leg, it would be a, skin, a, a scale follicle. If you took a little chunk from a fish, you'd get another scale follicle. So there's scale follicles, bird uh, feather follicles, and hair follicles. When we look at the DNA in those follicles, they're almost exactly alike. And then when we look at the DNA that produces the proteins that makes hair, scale, scales, and feathers, it's almost exactly like we can show relationships. That's important. Evolution wouldn't mean anything if we couldn't show relationships. If, if we found that a, a dog was more genetically related to a frog than it is to a cat, we'd know something's wrong, but we never find that. We know we've got so much information genetically that we probably, we may never figure it all out. We spend a lot of time here talking about fossils. Fossils don't mean anything as far as evolution is concerned. We don't need them. We got all the evidence we need to prove evolution without fossils. Forget fossils. They just aren't important. What's important is time, DNA. Please. All right. Um, the question was, uh, what's the purpose of life, okay? Joseph Stalin executed 14,700 Polish officers, prisoners of war, at the Katyn Forest. Why did he do that? How do you execute prisoners of war? Adolf Hitler executed at least six million Jews plus millions of others. Why would a person kill Jews? Well, Hitler thought they were an inferior species that hadn't evolved as far. He was actually trying to speed up the evolution process. 1975 to 79, the Khmer Rouge, under the leadership of Paul Pot, executed more than one-third of their entire population. Check out the killing fields. Why did they do that? Why were the Australian Aborigines treated like they were animals? Why were Australian Aboriginal skulls dug up out of graves or people were executed and their skulls were boiled down and they were sold to museums in America to have displays for evolution because they have a bigger jaw than other humans do? Kip Kinkle said, if there was a God, he wouldn't let me feel the way I do. There is no God, only hate. Huh. Well, on May 1st, May 21st, 1998, 15-year-old Kip Kinkle, a student at Thurston High School in Oregon, entered the cafeteria, fired more than 50 rounds from a semi-automatic rifle. 26 students were injured, two were killed. Later, the bodies of his parents were found in his home. He was, taken, he was arrested, taken to a police headquarters where he attempted to murder a detective. He said, if there was a God, he wouldn't let me feel the way I do. There's no God, only hate. Why have violent crimes increased nearly a thousand percent since I was a boy? And that's the time evolution became a popular theory in our textbook. Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris uh, made a video prior to the Columbine shootings. They're talking about a football player. They said he doesn't deserve the jaw evolution gave him. Look for his jaw. It won't be on his body. Klebold's father was a geologist who believed in evolution. Both Eric and Dylan were followers of Nazi teachings. The shooting took place on Hitler's birthday on purpose. It was planned to commemorate Hitler. Eric's t-shirt said, Natural Selection. They killed Cassie and Rachel just because they were Christians. They killed Isaiah just because he was black. Hitler hated black people. After all, they hadn't evolved as far. That was Hitler's thinking. The clothes may give a clue to the thinking of these teenagers. It said natural selection. Yes. What about this natural selection? Well, natural selection selects. It doesn't create a thing. It selects. That's all it can do. It's not, a, it's not a creation process. We go into that some other time. So my answer to the question is, is there a purpose to life? Absolutely, there certainly is. God created this universe with a plan. He created man with a purpose. Now, I have found in my doing, speaking on this topic about 800 times a year all over the world and 15 years worth now, the reason people accept the evolution theory is not because they have a scientific reason. I asked a kid two weeks ago, I was debating uh, two professors, or I forget where I was, it doesn't matter, three weeks ago. One kid came afterwards and said, evolution's a fact. I said, well, son, hold on, calm down. Let me ask you a question. If evolution, if, if creation was true, if the creation story is true, would that affect your lifestyle any? If there was a creator that said, thou shalt not commit adultery, don't, no pornography, no lying, no cheating, no stealing, would that affect your lifestyle any? He said, you're trying to embarrass me, aren't you? I said, I don't even know who you are. I'm just asking you a question. The reason people accept evolution is because of their please. sin, not their science. Dr. Hoven, this question is going to you first. Uh, you've mentioned the second law of thermodynamics to uh, 
prove that God must have provided the initial energy or the initial something in the universe. Uh, have you considered that some of the laws of nature only work in certain situations? For example, Newtonian physics breaks down towards the speed of light. Uh, so does the, the second law of thermodynamics really prove that God created the universe? Uh, there are several ways to define the second law of thermodynamics. There's all kinds of, uh, um, let me try to get, well, it'll take me a minute, but basically it bo all, they all boil down to the same thing. Matter, everything tends toward disorder, okay? Things don't order. That doesn't prove God created the universe, and it certainly doesn't prove the biblical view, okay? And it doesn't prove everybody ought to become an independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating Baptist like me. However, if you keep studying, you will get there, okay? Uh, I think the second law of thermodynamics demonstrates there must have been a beginning. Since everything is winding down, everything is falling apart, there had to be a beginning. There had to be something that wound it up. So yes, I think the second law of thermodynamics is proof positive that there was a beginning. Even the evolutionist will admit that. Oh yeah, 20 billion years ago, well, uh, what was before that? Was there any time or space before there was matter? And where did this matter come from? They have a totally illogical theory. Uh, yes, I think that it's logical to say in the beginning God instead of in the beginning, you know, nothing, or in the beginning dirt, or in the beginning matter, you know. They worship matter like the Christ Christian worships God. There's no difference. They're both religious. I think ours is more logical and scientifically defensible, but they're both ultimately, in the, in the final analysis, are simply religious theories. Um, so the second law of thermodynamics, which is, as far as anybody knows, universally believed, uh, as far as Newton's law is breaking down at, as you approach the speed of light, there's a lot of theories about that. There's also theories, there's an article in Discover Magazine uh, last year, April of 2003, that says Einstein was simply wrong, folks, okay? There's a large article in there. The speed of light is not a constant. So I don't think it's correct to say that we know for sure that these laws break down as we approach the speed of light. It may be true. I don't know. I don't think anybody knows would be my point. Uh, I cover quite a bit about the speed of light and evidences of it uh, ev in the last 10 years, proofs actually, scientific experiments that say the speed of light is not a constant. I'll get you some of those here. Um, if I can get, oh, no, sorry about that. See, I told you about asking the questions in the right order, didn't I? Remember that? Uh, be a lot faster. Um, the second law of thermodynamics says everything's falling apart. There's lots of stars out there. I mean, like billions and billions of stars. We don't have a clue how any one of them could form by chance. And yet, obviously, they're here. So the second law of thermodynamics, the Christian would predict that God created a universe and we'll see things falling apart. The universe is, is winding down, okay? It's not getting better. And stars are blowing up. It's called a nova or a supernova if it's a big one. So, yeah, we're losing things. And eventually, the universe will experience what's called a heat death. Everything will be uniformly cold. And right now they look out in space and see this three degree Kelvin, you know, uh, minus 270 uh, centigrade or minus 452.7, whatever it is, Fahrenheit. You know, it's a universal temperature out there. It seems to be the same everywhere. And it seems to be this background noise, this radiation. Okay, that appears to be true. Well, what does it prove? Oh, that proves the Big Bang. Oh, it doesn't prove the Big Bang. It doesn't prove the Big Bang at all. Nobody's for sure what's causing that. We are seeing uh, stars appear to be drifting away like the red shift, okay? There's not much question there's a red shift. The assumption is that maybe it's caused by the Doppler effect, but actually nobody knows what's causing the red shift. I, even if it's true that it is stars drifting away or moving away, that would still beg the question of where did the energy come from to propel this thing? Where did the star itself come from? And I don't think we can prove positively that the, the red shift is proof of either great distances or that the universe is, that stars are moving away. They get the same thing with parallel motion or perpendicular motion to your line of sight. This guy said there was an early sign that red shifts indicate distance of galaxies. For quasars, however, the diagram shows a wide scatter in apparent brightness at every redshift. In fact, there is little correlation of brightness to redshift at all. Either quasars come in an extremely wide range of intrinsic luminosities, as most people believe, or their redshifts do not indicate distance. Hmm, Sky and Telescope magazine ten years ago. Thus, for us, the only conclusion can be that can be drawn is that at least some quasars are relatively nearby, and a large fraction of their redshift is due to something other than expansion of the universe. Some people think redshift is for the Doppler effect from stars leaving. Maybe so. If it is, that's still an example of the second law. We see things get old, they die, they fall apart. And if their, if their philosophy of life is you're only here to pass on your genes, that's the only reason you exist, eat, drink, and be merry, tomorrow we die, that's a pretty pessimistic worldview. I think there's a much better view than that. You were created in God's image with a purpose. It's true everything's falling apart. The heavens wax old. I, I'm getting old. Everything's falling apart. My car's falling apart. Everything falls apart. How did it get wound up? 
Where did the initial organization, energy, uh, and intelligence come from? Information is consistently being lost. Every time your DNA replicates, the little pieces break off, and you, you know, it's like split ends on a hair, and you eventually you can only replicate it so many times, and it, it quits replicating, and you die. You know, the, if we are a copy off of a copy, 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 off of a copy of Adam, it's amazing we can even stand here and talk about it, okay? The information must have been incredible in the original because it's been degrading ever since. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Everything is degrading. This building is degrading. If you don't have people constantly maintain this building, it will fall apart. The entire highway system in America will fall completely apart if we don't keep maintaining it. Every building on this planet will fall down into a pile of rubble if somebody doesn't keep fixing it. And even then, if they try desperately to keep fixing it, at some point, it's still going to fall down. It's inevitable. That's the second law. So if you think that evolution can overcome that second law, I would like to understand how, okay? The second law tells us everything's falling apart, therefore, obviously, there must have been a beginning. I can answer that in ten words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's a logical answer for me. You can have the rest of my time. All right. Are we supposed to rebut this? Can you do that? I'll try. That's a mouthful, um, to say the, the least. First of all, the, the laws of thermodynamics uh, are commonly called the laws of thermodynamics. People like to talk about the second law. Albert Einstein has said that the laws of thermodynamics are the only laws that will stand and never be overthrown forever. Stephen Hawking, uh, a person who is believed to be one of the brightest uh, men on the planet has used the second law of thermodynamics to show the mechanism by which black holes have, have worked, which, you know, I think that's, that's rather amazing. Uh, the opponent is saying truly uh, diversity is a, a measure of the second law of thermodynamics, but I, I Let's don't badmouth it too muchly because as the universe, as it exists, as we know it, it's the only one that can exist for us to exist to follow these particular principles. So therefore, you know, I'm, I'm very reluctant to say this is something that we want to have, to, to ask God to overthrow that. Uh, it seems to be the very, maybe the uh, the very thing that uh, will make it possible for things to exist. Energy and how it got together, I don't know. But the fact that it is in a concentrated form that can go to a less deformed kind of, uh, less uh, concentrated form, and we can utilize when things go from hot places to cold places. And we did that when he drove our automobiles here today. You did this, you're driving around with an automobile that's 8,000 degrees Fahrenheit inside of that engine with the burning of gasoline. But you know, you don't have to have that inside of the car. Of course, you're, you're surrounded by the 40 degrees or 50 degrees uh, temperatures that you're driving through the, through the, um, through the atmosphere. Uh, the, the laws of thermodynamics are much misunderstood. I can look out across the, the uh, class uh, or the students here, and many of them are my, my students, and uh, I, can probably, I can probably confess to the confusion that exists in thermodynamics. I probably contributed a great contribution <laughs> To, to adding to that confusion, but um, the, uh, what we have heard today are, and, and I've, I've got to, I, I like to use colorful language, so I'm very careful, and I'm told I can't do that here, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to have to leave it with this, that I, I'm certainly glad I don't have to step in something. Thank you. This question will be posed to your table. Uh, evolutionary theory predicts that mankind will continue to evolve. 
How long, in your estimation, will it take for a distinct new species of humans to emerge? In other words, how long will it take for there to be two or more incompatible species of humans? Uh, and let me add something to that. Where, where do you foresee this going, the evolution of, of humans? Um, I can tell you one thing. We'll never have a war because there's been a disagreement on science. Um, what we will have is people advancing because we've learned how to live with each other. If we don't do that, we're not going to advance at all. Um, we have um, um, certain things that are going to take place with every species. If we go back and look how species have evolved over time, we can see that almost everything that's ever lived on this planet is extinct. <laughs> Evolution is a really um, inefficient situation. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, the intelligent designer is about as inefficient as you can get. Do you know how many kids die every year because they choke to death because our throat and our windpipe are so close together? I mean, whoever designed that? A first year engineering student could do better than that. Uh, just think how many people in this audience probably got all kinds of hang-ups because we've got a, a system that gets rid of our waste material right near a system that we, do, we reproduce with. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of animals that got better reproductive systems than that. They don't, you know, that the intelligent designer designed a snail that has his anus right above his mouth? Come on, who did that? Uh, we can explain those things by looking at evolution. You can't explain those things by looking at a designer. The designer did a terrible job on the eye. People have eye problems because the nerves in the cornea are in the, in, uh, the nerves in the retina are in the wrong place. Uh, it, if, uh, and it happened that way because that was the only thing evolution had to work with. There's all kinds of problems with design in the world. There's all kinds of problems with, with evolution. And what happens is we try to correct them. Now, what's going to happen to us in the future? It'll depend on us. I mean, I like the question because what it involves is ecology, it involves environment, it involves saving the planet, it involves, you, you know, under, what it involves is understanding evolution. You know, <laughs> uh, one of these textbooks, I think it's this one, it says, it says in here, do not worry about the future because God is going to kill all of us. <laughs> Soon, <laughs> you know, uh, they say almost word for word. <laughs> what they said in here is, do not give your life for evolution, because I mean, do not give your life for environment, because the environment will be destroyed by the Lord. You know, well, if you believe that, then I guess you don't need to worry about the ecology. I guess you don't need to worry about the environment. But I don't believe that. And I think that we should worry about the environment. I think we should worry about the future of our kids. I think we should worry about what's going on. And I think we should understand evolution so that we can stay healthy when we're doing it. We need to understand our immune systems. We under, need to understand that bacteria change in a moment's notice. We, under, we need to understand that highly formed animals can't change quickly. And we're a highly formed animal. We, uh, we evolve really slowly. Bacteria evolve very rapidly. Insects can evolve uh, certain things in just a matter of a, a few months. We're, we evolve slowly. We need to understand what's going on with our DNA. We need to understand what's going on with the DNA of every plant and animal that lives on this planet. That's how we survive. And if we don't do that, we may not survive. It's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's that simple, actually. We need, we need to use our brains. We cannot be in the situation where we say, here's a book that's got all the answers in it. We don't need to know anything new. When my father talked to me when I was a boy and he said, when you read a book, be sure to look in the back of it and see if there's a good bibliography. If there's not a good bibliography in there, it may be that the things in that book aren't true. And then he handed me a Bible, and I looked for the bibliography, and there wasn't one. That's all I got to say. <laughs>
Uh, I, well, I, I just kind of uh, wonder whether uh, there's any kind of a reason to assume that uh, evolution would necessarily lead to some kind of proliferation of uh, one particular species. Uh, that's that's uh, sort of uh, an uh, assumption in the question that I don't really quite comprehend uh, why it makes that. I think if we look back, we know that uh, the uh, we're coming from proliferation. That is, uh, I understand that uh, uh, some comments have been that the Neanderthal uh, does not share our genes. That uh, is, is that uh, are you up on that? That, that is, we had a proliferated species. Neanderthal was also sure. uh, uh, human-related, sure. and there's every indication that uh, uh, chimpanzees are of the same branch in some way or other because they have an intelligence of a five-year-old and are capable of uh, manipulating language and communicating with us. So we're sharing this world already with uh, 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 quite a few uh, different species that are awfully close to us. Uh, let me also mention the dolphin. There are stories that go back all the way to Roman times of cooperation between hu human and, and dolphin. So if we're talking about uh, uh, intelligent uh, uh, siblings, I suppose, uh, on this uh, uh, planet, there may be plenty already. We don't have to wait for that to develop. Beyond that, I don't know what the future will bring. Uh, and, and I think that is what characterizes uh, scientific mentality, is that you are willing to live with uncertainty, yet don't know it all. That's why you're motivated to learn more. And uh, I quite agree with that, uh, with all the answers in one book. That's very authoritarian, undemocratic uh, kind of thinking. Uh, one of the most frequent, since uh, uh, our uh, colleague here uh, mentioned Adolf Hitler, one of the most frequent words in Adolf Hitler's mouth, my, mouth was God and divine providence. Therein lies danger. It's an authoritarian kind of thinking that is not healthy. All right, uh, that's interesting. I don't want to step in much of that either myself. Um, how long will it take for us to evolve into a new species? Uh, I don't, nothing ever evolves into any new species. Oh, well, I had to use the word species. So nothing ever evolves into a new kind. Nobody's ever observed anything change to a different kind. Bacteria are still bacteria. If they become resistant to a drug, it's because they lost the locking mechanism on the ribosome so the antibiotic can't lock on. It's no different than somebody handcuffing everybody, hauling them off to jail to kill them, but you don't have any arms. So they can't handcuff you, so you survive. Wow, beneficial mutation. Uh, well, it might be for the moment, but it's not any new information. Bacteria don't evolve into something else. They lose information. They're resistant to a particular drug for a short time, but then you put them back in the population of regular bacteria, and they're inferior. Nothing ever, the bacteria are still bacteria for heaven's sake. That's not an example of evolution. Okay. We're going to evolve how to get along. People choke because of poor design. How many of you happen to like the design of your esophagus and your trachea? I use mine. I've been using it for years. Okay. It works fine. Okay. Um, the, 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 the purpose of life is to save the planet and to understand evolution. Let's get more government funding so we can teach more of this stuff. So more kids can not only step in it, but wallow in it here. He said the eye is a poor design. Well, now let's see about that. Um, Charles Darwin said, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd. Okay, and yet he goes on for four pages after that and tells how he think it happened. The retina of your eye is about one square inch. It has 137 million light-sensitive cells wired to the brain. I've done a huge amount of electrical wiring in my lifetime. I cannot imagine hooking up 137 million connections in one square inch. My Heavenly Father did it, and it works pretty good. It worked till a couple years ago. I had to get these dumb things, okay? Because that's an example of second law of thermodynamics, by the way, decay. Now, um, I debated an atheist in Buckler, Ed Buckler, Buckner in New York. He said the eye is poorly designed, like I believe I just heard a few moments ago. It's a poor design. He said the retina is in front. The blood vessels are in front of the retina, so they block part of the light coming in. He said the octopus has a much better eye because their blood vessels are behind the retina. That's proof of evolution because of poor design. I said, Ed... We live in the air, okay? Air is a poor insulator for UV light. Your body needs the blood vessels in front of the retina because that's your last defense against UV light. Wa octopus live in the water, okay? Water blocks UV light. They don't need their blood vessels in front. Now, if you want to swap eyes with an octopus, you just go ahead and enjoy yourself, but you're going to be blind in a few days, okay? 
And their argument from poor design is like saying, well, God wouldn't do it this way, therefore it must have evolved. That's a lousy argument for evolution. That's a proof evidence, that's an evidence to me that we were originally perfectly designed and we're the whole, whole, all of humanity is just plain falling apart, folks. And yes, God's going to have to step in here pretty soon and we're going to all kill ourselves. Okay, thank you so much. Professors uh, Reisbig, Schlieper, and Strayer, uh, in the interest of time, seeing that we uh, have left time for a 10 minute closing statement uh, for each side, let's go ahead and present those now. Would you please go ahead? Thank you. Okay, this is, uh, this is my closing, right? Yes. Okay, good. Well, this is uh, this has been an interesting discussion that uh, we've we've had. Uh, I, uh, I I wonder how we have uh, all changed in our, our minds and thinking and knowledge uh, of what we have uh, talked about. Um, we've talked about some good information. I've heard some bad uh, information. Uh, I happen to believe in the scientific method. Without the scientific method, we have no defense of, of sinking into ignorance and despair. And to people who do not understand the, the things that have been accumulated for science, we, we, are, we are cursed to do ignorance and ignore and 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 what I would uh, what I will repeat, voodoo science that people will will believe in in, in crazy uh, kinds of things, and and we see those kind of things going on uh, in people today. Uh, the one the one thing that we have is that we have knowledge and we have a way of, of testing knowledge and putting to the test of a number of people essentially to evaluate and agree in what is as correct as we possibly can. Uh, if, if we have nothing, uh, then we, we are in despair and, and we, have, uh, we have nothing that we can possibly uh, survive. I don't think that is true. I think the scientific method is, uh, is a wonderful thing, and I think, it, uh, uh, I think we, uh, the discussion we've had today has, has proved that, uh, that it is correct. When you die, the world is not going to change. The world will stop because your world is in your head all along. You have no direct contact with the world out there. You have no immediate knowledge of the world. The only knowledge you have is immediate knowledge through your senses. For that reason, you work with frameworks, trying to understand, theoretical frameworks, trying to understand what's going on out there. You're trying to make tenuous predictions about what you think the next event will be. And if the tenuous prediction doesn't work out, then you're going to overturn the hypothesis that you worked on. Evolution is no different. It's a theoretical framework. As long as new information framework, we're going to keep working with it. When we have an overwhelming evidence that doesn't fit, then the scientific community will be just as comfortable overturning that and altering it to something different. And it's a fairly simple system. That's why it works. What we've been uh, uh, shown today is that we should throw that out, replace it with a spiritual being where we don't have any idea how it is interacting with the material world and that material world, which we can't really understand either. And in that complicated system, we're supposed to uh, work scientifically. I suppose the next time you go to the physician and you have some kind of a pain it will be pointed out to you, it's probably some little rock that God forgot there. Doesn't make any sense to me. 
and, and what I want to say uh, 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 to conclude here, uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, Dr. Hovind uh, offered a general ethical principle, and that is that we have an inheritance of sin. I find that abhorrent. I find that absolutely incredible to even believe that. Anybody who has seen a baby and has holding it in your arms, would you really believe that that is hellbound? That that has inherited sin? It's a, it's a, it's a most uh, objectionable concept that uh, is being carried around here in the name of uh, religion. And for that reason, I also believe that we really do have a very clear-cut uh, science ev because evolution is self-correcting. It is uh, accumulating data. That ch it's checking each other. It has the open scientific community exchanging ideas with each other, checking on each other, and not some kind of an authoritative uh, uh, system that is loaded uh, down on us where, where we have no possibility of questioning. The one is democracy, the scientific community. The other is a form of authoritarianism that I find very objectionable. I'd like to quote from this creationist book for my closing. Um, there's a section in here, 342, that says, scientific truths revealed in the Bible. Many important scientific truths were revealed in the Bible thousands of years before they were discovered by modern scientists. And then it lists several of them. One of them has to do with uh, the Earth rotating on its axis, and that's you know the six-day thing. Another one has to do with the Earth running down, the second alternate dynamics. And there's some stuff about blood and water and that kind of stuff. But anyway, here is the proof from the Bible that the Earth rotates on its axis. It says it tells these students to check Luke 17:31 through 34. <clears throat> In that day. He which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down and take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not be turned back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in the night there shall be two men in one bed, and one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. I did not understand that. I called a Becca. I said, what does that mean? Will you check with the teacher's manual to find out what that means? And they, came, they went right, and they came back, they said, we're sorry, that's not mentioned in the teacher's manual. I said, well, you know, is it a possibility, is it a misprint? They took that as an insult and said, no, it's not a possibility, and click, they hung up. The second one. The universe is running down. To find out the proof from the Bible that the universe is running down, you go to Isaiah 51, 6, and it says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell within shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. I didn't understand that either. I hope the applause means that you understood that that has something to do with the second law of thermodynamics and not to, anyway. It might. <laughs> anyway, I decided to take a quote from one of the best known creationists in the country explaining to me, or to all of us, why all these colleges all over the world do not accept creationism. And here's the quote. It's from a fellow named Kent Hovine. And it came, the source is, I got it from the internet, the unmasking the false religion of evolution. Here's his quote. There is definitely a conspiracy but I don't think it's a human conspiracy. I don't believe that there's smoke-filled rooms where groups of men get together and decide to teach evolution in all the schools. I believe it is a much higher level. I believe it is a satanic conspiracy. The reason these different people come to the same conclusions is not because they all met together, it's because they all work for the devil.
I think that was one of the most arrogant statements I've ever read in my life. <laughs> and if we're going to use the Bible for science, we've got some tough things to explain. What about the cockatrice? It's mentioned four times in the Bible. It's a chicken, a rooster that lays poison eggs that can fly and spits fire. The, what are we gonna do about dragons being mentioned 17 times in the Bible? What are you going, what are you gonna do about uh, unicorns or mentioned eight times in the Bible? I wanna tell you what, we have never found a fossil of a unicorn. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we did? Then you people would have something to applaud for. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, first, I need to say, fellas, I thank you so much for doing this. Uh, these students get about nine months out of the year teaching on evolution. It's about time they get a couple hours on at least to hear a conflict between creation and evolution. And I will be glad to come back at my expense any time. Now, people say, oh, creationists win the debates because they have, you know, better visuals. Okay, I don't use any tax dollars to buy my visuals. You guys got unlimited funding to buy stuff. Here, get some better visuals. Don't blame me. People say, well, creationists win because they have a dumb audience. The dumb aud people are dumb if they believe in creation. That's, that's the implication over and over. People be believe because we need more money to teach evolution. That's why it's a lack of funding. That's why we're losing these debates. No, maybe you're losing the debates because you're wrong. <laughs> and I'm right, okay? Um, several points were brought up, and I'll use a few of my minutes for this, and then I want to give a quick closing here. I'm in favor of the scientific method. You develop a theory, you gather facts to support your theory. If you can't find any facts, you throw the theory away. Evolution would have been thrown away a long time ago, except they don't have a replacement theory, other than maybe somebody designed it. Oh, they don't want that one. He mentioned uh, he doesn't believe about inherent sin. Well, I happen to have had three kids and two grandkids, one more due any day. We didn't teach any of them to lie or cheat or steal. But they all just kind of did it automatically. How many of you notice the same thing with your kids when you're raising them, okay? Yes, I think it's quite obvious to anybody that's raised any kids, there is an inherent sin nature. If you think man is inherently good, you're living in la-la land, okay? Man is inherently bad, okay? And he needs a savior. You um, said you don't want an authoritative system. That's very objectionable to you. That is my entire point. The reason people reject the creation story is because they don't want somebody telling them what to do. The Bible says in the last days scoffers would come that would be willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. Second Peter chapter 3, read it for yourself. They're willingly ignorant of the creation because that creation event tells us God created this place, which means he owns it, which means he makes the rules. They don't want to admit there was a flood because that flood indicates God has the authority to judge his creation. They just don't want to admit that. I cover this very thoroughly, by the way, on seminar part two. You might want to watch that one. Um, and they're right there out there. And my by the way, my stuff's not copyrighted. You can get it, copy it, send back the originals and get your money back. That's always been our policy. Um, so yes, I can understand why the idea of an authoritarian uh, you know, Bible is objectionable to some people, because that Bible says thou shalt not do you know, quite a few things, okay? So yeah, I, I understand. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I think the evidence for a designer is so obvious all around us. If you're walking through the woods and you find a painting hanging on the tree and you see no footprints, you see no people, you still conclude there was a painter. If you're walking through the woods and you find a building and you see no footprints, you see no people, you still conclude there was a builder. When you see a watch, that's proof of a watchmaker. When you see a creation, that's proof of a creator, whether you ever meet him or not. There just had to be one. Now, who is it? Is it Allah or Buddha or Jehovah? Well, that's a different set of arguments, but the fact is there must have been a designer, whoever he was. There had to be a designer. We can argue later about which one's right, okay? But there had to be. People object to that. You said, what does Luke mean? Luke was telling them that in that day, some will be in the field and some will be in bed. That's proof the world is round. It's dark on one side. That's evidence right there. So I can explain. I don't know why Becca couldn't explain it, but that's pretty obvious to me. Now, oh, hang on, what happened here? Okay. <clears throat> I 
visited Wayne Strickland's tombstone. I don't know if the other date's filled in yet or not. It's been a couple of years since I've been there, but the date was empty when I was there. He said he's an atheist. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. God does not believe in atheists. And I, actually, I don't either, okay? Um, you're going to die one of these days. I'm going to die. Now, fellas, I didn't drive all the way over here and leave my gorgeous wife because I like being gone, okay? I, I didn't come to win an argument. I came to win you over. Honestly, I would like to see you saved, going to heaven. Maybe you think you are. I don't know. But if you think God used evolution, you have the wrong God, okay? I know you write all kinds of articles for the uh, Atheist magazine, according to your bio here, Jim. And, and I think that people run from God. People can't find God for the same reason a thief can't find a policeman. I sacrifice my time to travel and to do this because I'm concerned that people are actually dying and going to hell. I'm really concerned that that really happens. I believe the Bible teaches that. I believe that's literally true. I believe we were designed for a purpose. And God loves each of us. He hates our sin. The Bible says he's angry with the wicked every day. God hates our sin, but he loves us. And we are inherently sinful. And we're going to die. All of us are going to die. And you're going to be dead for a really, really long time. Okay? George Washington died 205 years ago, and he is still dead. I don't care how long you live, you're going to be dead longer than that. And you better think about that long and hard. You better be really positive you're right on this one. God made this world. He owns it. He makes the rules. And we are guilty of breaking his rules. So rather than admit we've broken his rules, people say, well, there is no God. We got it by evolution, which means, of course, there are no rules. If evolution is true, there are no rules. I asked the question at the beginning. I never got an answer. If evolution is true, how do we tell right from wrong? How do we tell right from wrong? God told us very clearly, thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. We've all lied. Don't steal. We've stolen things. We broke his commandments, folks. We're guilty, period, which means we're going to be punished, or you've got to find a substitute. And that's where Jesus comes in. The God that made this world also came down and said, look, you blew it. You're all sinners. You're all going to hell. However, I still love you, and I still want to forgive you. I'll even die and take your place. You can't beat a deal like that. Now, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 gives us a clear progression, and I would recommend every atheist or evolutionist or agnostic read Romans chapter 1 very carefully. Because that which may be known of God, he, he may be known, okay, you may know things about him, you can learn about God. That which may be known is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. You know there's a designer. Okay, I don't care about all your arguments. You know somebody made this place. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Judgment day, you're just flat, seriously in trouble. Okay? Because then when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They worship the creation. That's what evolution's all about. Save the planet. Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through their own lust to dishonor their own hearts and dishonor their own bodies between them. He changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped, served and, uh, worshiped, uh, worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. I mean, to them... Uh, the animals are more important. Look, I like animals. I take care of the animals we have around our place. And I think Christians take care of their things. But, folks, this whole concept of nature is all there is. We've got to save the planet. I don't pollute. I try hard not to. I work very hard to keep our place clean. And we do a very good job, I think. You can come visit Pensacola, Florida. But that's not the, that's not the ultimate goal of life. The Bible says God gave them up. You follow this trend. They don't want God telling them what to do, so God gives up on them. Okay, you do what you want. And they get turned over to vile affections. That's the way it always goes. It descends, if you can read the rest of the chapter, it goes right into homosexuality. By the way, if your job is to pass on your genes and you're the fittest, well, they're not the fittest, that's for sure. They're not passing on any genes to anybody. Uh, it talks, I've been a long time on that one, but God's going to judge this planet. He tells us he's going to have to because man has rejected him. Now, they professed them. They thought they were wise. They became fools. And if you believe your grandpa was a rock, you're a fool. Some of my ancestors probably swung by their necks, okay, but none of them swung by their tails. Now, 
If you think your grandpa was a monkey, I think you're still a fool, but that's okay. You have the right to believe that. You do not, however, have the right to use tax dollars to teach that fairy tale in a public university at taxpayer expense. I think evolution should be taught in private schools at private expense. Now, you guys are not the enemy. I, don't, I, 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 I love you, and I want to help you, okay? I think you're deceived, and it's worse that you're deceiving others if you're teaching this stuff. Now, there are people here tonight with yellow shirts on. If you'd stand up, if you would, you're supposed to be standing up with a yellow shirt, you know who you are. These people right here are willing to talk to you and show you how you can become a Christian and go to heaven. Okay, that's why I do this. I want to convert people, get them saved. That's why I'm here, okay? I think the scientific evidence is on our side. I think I'm right. I think I won the debate tonight, actually. But uh, it's not because I'm smart. It's because I'm right, and God loves you. He wants to save you and forgive you. See, one of these folks afterwards will be glad to help any way we can. Thank you so much. We hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But... Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6, 23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now, and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. Forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, If you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help.